Welcome to another episode of the Tower 26 B Race Ferry Podcast. I'm Jim Vinsky here once again with Coach Sherry Rodriguez. <laughs> Coach, what is up, my man? Say, I'm say telling you're, you, you're you're getting better at this. You're, you're getting back in the groove again after it, missing it, so many introductions. Smooth. This is, this is like three weeks in a row we've done this. Also with us, Emily Cox. Coach Emily. Hey, say how are you? To, say hi to all your loyal fans out there. You are becoming a regular on this. Actually, you're getting more fan mail than myself or Jerry combined. So I oh, hope you should. Uh, As yeah, she she's, should. She's about to get kicked off because she's stepping on my toes. But hey, we are extremely honored on this episode to have the queen. Can I call her the queen being the, of where her lineage comes from? The queen of triathlon. Emma Kate Lidbury is back with us on the air. Emma Kate, how are you? Hey, hey, Jim. I'm very well. Thank you. You know, we kind of put this together last minute. And I, I reached out this morning. I'm at my, doc, my, my wife's doctor appointment where, hey, we'll get into that in a second because that's the big news. But and I said, you know what? Emma Kate was boots on the ground at St. George's last weekend. She's been having some amazing uh revelations in what she's been doing through triathlete magazine because she is the managing editor am i right managing editor of triathlete That's magazine correct. that is correct yeah i did do my research i do a little bit of research for this show it's not all ad lib and not all improv i actually researched that part of it but uh but you were boots on the ground in saint george and you've done this this new training model with coach alan cousins am i right that's correct yeah you've been practicing the norwegian way of training if i can say that so we're gonna get a little bit a little bit into that but you are the self-proclaimed queen of triathlon am i right I don't know whether I'd say self-proclaimed. That might have just been your pro proclamation, uh, Jim. But uh, but we could, so, yeah, we, we can so, roll with it. So you're the queen of triathlon. You're a lab rat because you're testing out this new training method because you're the average age group triathlete. You're a podcast host. You're the Coach managing. I'm very happy about that. You're the managing editor of Triathlete Magazine. I mean, what don't you do? You've been in this. You perform professional triathlete. I mean, are you? Do you cook? Do you clean? What else do you do? I do. I do all those things. Yeah, so you have a lot of fun. You're I'm actually very tired. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. I can tell. You know, you just landed this morning, so we're not expecting a lot out of you. I'm expecting Coach Jerry to bring the energy for this show. Uh, Jerry, are you up to the task of being I'm, the energy? I'm ready. I'm the ready, energy big this boy. Podcast. But I, I skip. I went through all that other stuff. The most important thing that you've done in your credentials is your best-selling author. Now, to have the best-selling author that is Emma Kate on with the person who you you didn't really ghostwrite the book because you're the best-selling author but you you co-authored the book triathlon sure. swimming the tower 26 method with coach jerry i mean how does it feel to have the band back together it's pretty nice actually yeah how long ago was it that we uh, did the podcast where we talked about the book that was a couple of years ago probably years years still yeah. one of our biggest podcasts but i mean it's kind of like Let, when the... let's set the record straight though she wrote the entire book so that's why she's she, that's why I don't call that's why I don't call you the best selling author, Jack. I call her, exactly. I've introduced you as the best selling author. I've introduced yes. her as the best selling author. But hey, you guys are a great team. But I think it's like the Beatles. When they broke up, they never spoke to each other again. Maybe Aww. I just kind of made that up. You guys haven't spoken years, have you? Because of that that <laughs> disagreement. We talk all the time, Jimmy. Don't try and create <laughs> stuff that's not there. <laughs> I need some time. Emily, do you feel the tension in the air right now? It's palpable. <laughs> okay so i so jerry i need you to bring the app bring the the heat on this the energy in this episode you ever take a pill and it's just stuck in your throat i have a pill stuck in my throat right now so I'm tr i might have some coughing and hacking through well you're excited I mean, you got you're, you're in like two day countdown time for no we just get here so ek we are expecting a baby any second i said this last week it could be any second because megan ate indian food right before the show and i said we might have to run out to the hospital we just came from the doctor wow. The baby is imminent. I mean, she's having contractions every 10 minutes. So seriously, this might be the first podcast to have a live birth happen on the podcast. And because we do have a, 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 a fellow podcast host on with us right now, she can lead you guys through it in description because the way she paints pictures with her words on the Triathlete podcast, which we still have a bone to pick me and you because I haven't been asked on the Triathlete podcast yet. Okay, you can be the, you can be the next guest, Jim. That was what, two years ago? Oh, hey, you said it here first. But hey, we are on we are on Facebook Live. If you guys have any questions, Coach Megan is monitoring Facebook Live. She'll get those into us through the chat. You can write anything you want. Anything's on the table. But uh, but that being said, Jerry, what did we talk about the last episode? I don't remember. What what did we go over? Do you remember? Emily, do you recall? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. We it talked, was a showstopper. <laughs> it was a showstopper. We talked about St. George and yeah. kind of how to pace and approach your race day for success and. We use St. George kind of as the example, but it works across all races. 
Yes, it does. And speaking of St. George, we had uh, Christian Blumenfeld took the win there. It was a, uh, it was a really, and, and Emma's going to, Emma Kate's going to get into this in a little bit, but really uh, inspirational performance, if you will. Listening countries, Norway, where, where Christian is from, number 14 on our listening list. But Chair, do you know who is making a move on, on that listening list for our, for our uh, listening countries? Mexico. They were, they're up three spaces in the last two weeks. What's going on down in Mexico? I don't know. Well, wait a minute. David Y just went to Mexico. One. San- am I, Santa- is that am I right? Yeah, Santa Claus Santa himself. Claus? Santa Claus right. himself went down there. One. He was a big. Uh, he was wearing the Tower Twenty Six logo on his chest, and they put him all over the Tri Mexico Instagram page. That could be it. So wait, did he win? What did he win? Sixty five to sixty nine age group, right? Sixty five, sixty nine, sixty to sixty four, fifty five to than, fifty. Faster than sixty to sixty four, and yeah. faster than fifty five to fifty nine. Also, I think he's like so, second in fifty five to fifty nine. Let's close, say, but yeah. yeah. But so maybe maybe we owe him some of those listeners. That could be. Could be. So Big it could jump. be. That's good. So we want to say nadamos, mon, montamos, and corremos to all of our tri Mexico listeners. How's that sound? Do I sound like I know? Do, do I sound like I'm? I can speak the language. Not really, but not really. I can not speak the language. We don't have time to teach. All right, you, we're going to get right into Emma going. Kate. She's got to get going. She's got to take a nap. She's right off a plane. Emma Kate. The reason I wanted to have you on. So you are. You are an experienced, you're a professional triathlete. You've won races all around the globe as a, you know, as a professional, you've retired. How long ago did you retire? A couple of years ago. 2018. So, you know, your you know, your stuff, you know, the sport you were out there this weekend and there was, there was a 21 point something DNF rate at St. George world championships this past weekend. That's a high DNF rate. You're running around course. Let's just get off the cuff. Then we'll, we'll, we'll let this spiral out of control and the other topics I'm sure. But what did you see out there? From the from the you know the up top viewpoint, what were you seeing on course? Yeah, actually, I just wrote a story for triathlete.com this morning about the DNF rate for the in the pro field, and it was thirty percent. Yeah, thirty percent for the men, and for the women, there was one hundred percent finishes. Twenty two starters, twenty two reached the finish line. Um, so we'll we'll leave well, that you, there. Men, um, yes. women, women give birth, right? I, I I could never give birth. So I was talking to so I coached Conan O'Brien, right? And he's last week he's telling me how he hurt his foot. Right. And I said, oh, yeah, my wife's been in labor for a week. And he goes, oh, I feel like such an idiot complaining about my foot now. And I said, no, men, women were meant to have to give birth. Men were not meant to have foot pain. So you guys give birth. You can finish a damn race. (laughs) But uh, yes, that was like a that was an interesting insight, an interesting little nugget there. And yes, the DNF rate was high, but I think I think we all expected that Um, conditions were tough. The swim, swim was cold. You know, a lot of people were talking about the swim, and a lot. I think a lot of people were worried about the swim. I think, um, you know, as we as we know, and as as you know, at Tower Twenty Six, the swim is something that you have to be very well prepared for. And I think the combination of the conditions plus the fact that we're very early in the season, it's early May. Not many people have had much open water swim experience. It led to you know this combo of factors for the swim where I think uh, didn't set a lot of people up for success. You know. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, that bike course is kind of brutal. 7,000 feet of elevation gain um, over the 112 miles. Uh, it was very interesting to see the, the bike dynamics, especially in the men's race, play out. Well, both men's and women's pro races play out like they did. Um, I thought Cam Worth might just, you know, destroy the field a little bit more than he did. I think he still did pretty, you know, a, a decent amount of damage to to uh, to the men's field. Um But Daniela Reef, I think I saw her in the early, early stages of the bike, probably about in the first 10, 15 miles. And she was just riding like a woman who was going to win a world championship. It was very much the Daniela we've seen before, um, but, with a, with, but with a difference and we can, we can get back to that. Um, and yeah, and in the age group race, I mean, seeing some of the, they obviously started a lot later than the pros and um, the, the wave rollouts were, seemed to go on for a very long time in the swim, the swim start wave rollouts. And so those eight, there were a lot of age groupers. Uh, my my work day was finishing around about an hour or so after the pro. You know, I I wrote up the last article I was writing for triathlete.com, and that was probably around four four thirty p.m. And I went out on course to just cheer people and and pick up you know a bit more of the vibe and just be a bit of a spectator versus just working there. And uh, a lot of age groupers was going. Some of the age groupers who were just going out on course. Then I mean, it was very very hot. If I think the recorded temperature was 84, 85 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But um, it felt a lot hotter than that. And I was very grateful that I was standing there, standing there spectating. Um, so age groupers who, you know, age group, some of the age groupers who had a later start or were maybe like later, you know, um, in the 14 to 17 hour time bracket, like 
they were racing in some tough conditions, especially especially for this time of year when you know when we when we talk about Kona normally it's October and everybody's got a season in the northern hemisphere everybody's got a season of racing in them. Um, so yeah, and my dark my one of my dark uh, dark dark horse picks, one of my wild cards was Braden Curry for that very reason. He's southern, obviously from the New Zealand and uh, as a Kiwi Southern Hemisphere racer, he'd got a winter he'd got a season of racing under him coming into this race, and I think you could you could tell that when, the way he raced. Um, so there you go. There's my like quick blurb. Um, pick the bones from that. You know, like it, there's 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 tons to talk about. Uh, it was very, think, it was very interesting. Do you think a big problem of the, 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 the athletes who had tough time on course was that they just, obviously it's an early season, you know, world championship, but they, they just, they couldn't handle the nutrition and the cooling correctly in order to race there to their potential. You think that's a big problem? Yeah. I think that's always a big problem for, you know, in, in a well, lot of yes. hot, hot Ironman races, um, understanding how your, you know, what, your, your fueling strategy in training can be completely dialed, but when you step out onto a course like that, uh, you've had a tough swim and you've had a tough, it's been a tough bike ride and then you get onto the wrong course and it's very hot. I mean, is your body, is your physiology prepared for all of that? Like not, I'd say probably not, you know, um, especially like we say, especially in May. So. Yep. What do you got, Emily? Um, I was just going to, do you think that a lot of people maybe kind of, overpace things at the beginning and put out a lot more energy than they thought they did on maybe the swim and the bike, um, thus leading to meltdowns on the run in the pros and the age group field. Definitely. Definitely. I, I think you could, you could see that in the, in the pro men's race. Um, look at the way that Christian and, and Lionel Sanders came through the, at the very end of the race, right? Whereas I think Braden Curry raced with heart and soul, which we love, you know, some, some people love to see, you know, it was very, very, um, a very gutsy performance, but lacked, I think, lacked the precision that say Christian and Lionel had. And I think part of that was like, um, Braden was obviously in that front group who worked so, so hard on, on the bike and, and did get away and stayed away. But uh, I think he paid for that in towards the end of the run, and uh, that kind of precision that you see from the that you kind of see and you expect from the Norwegians, you, you, we we totally got from Christian. And uh, yeah, I mean, credit to Lionel Sanders, he he had a great race. And then I think that was something that you saw a lot in the age group field too, like coping with a swim that's cold, and you know maybe you just don't have that open water swim experience in the bank yet for that year, and you're still a little bit race rusty um and then working hard on the bike course you know that's a lot of 7,000 feet of elevation gain over 112 miles is a lot and um i think that probably led to a lot of age groupers who are probably working harder than they realized like you say uh especially when it's getting that hot you don't necessarily always feel it on the bike until you're it's too late and you're out on the wrong course so yeah i was told by a couple guys that were out there there was a pretty good headwind for a lot of the bike and you're in the 90 degree temperature. So you're sweating, it's evaporating right away. And you know, you're becoming dehydrated without really knowing it because that swim, that wind is hitting you in the face. Whereas yeah. you should be overhydrating because the wind winds hitting in your face, your face, you might, you might not realize how much you're actually losing and how much more you need it. Cause you're not getting that cooling efficiency of the sweat. Yeah. I spent a solid hour or so at the, about mile marker one or between mile, what mile, miles one and two on the run course so watching all the pro uh, all the pro field come through just to try and get like a little bit of a sense of oh who looks good and who's really suffering and and the same with the same same with some of the age groupers there and um i tell you like the the runners or the traffic the athletes who were running well were few and far between like you, and you could tell a lot of it was hydration and just uh heat heat you know just heat related so it, it really did stand out. Like I think um, Chris Leiferman was the three of the front guys. Chris, Chris Leiferman was the first guy that I saw came past who was running well, you know, running. So, what, so you, being a, you being around all these guys, lead, all these athletes, both age group and pros leading into the race, you know, you've done a ton of interviews, you've done articles on, you know, age groupers, professionals, the athletes who did well, how do you think they, their preparation was different than athletes who maybe struggled a little bit? Oh, I mean, that's a huge question because that, that could be so many, that could be so many things. I think, um, I think, you know, like, I, I don't think we can underscore enough, like the fact that it was, it was early in the year for a world championship race. Like we're normally, it's October yep. when we have this, this stature of racing. So, um, I think, 
I don't know. I, yeah, a, t- a ton of things like yeah, yeah nut- nutrition, the the heat. I mean, how many people are, are, are used to racing in that kind of training and racing at this time of year in that in that level of heat? And um, yeah, yeah, it, it could, the list could be quite long. I think. Yeah, well, I thought you had all the answers, but I guess you don't. But uh, Jared, what do you got? <laughs> well, I mean, you you have a combination there on that on that bike course of like you're saying seven eight thousand feet of elevation and the heat, right? And how many athletes, Jim, how many of our athletes, let's just t- take us, for, for example, who we think we prepare our athletes well, how many of our athletes uh, are used to doing 7,000 feet of elevation and combining that with um, pretty intense heat? For oh, yeah. I mean, so the, like the theme of the, the conversation so far, you don't have the load. So even if you're not doing that every ride, you don't have the load in your legs at this time of year. I mean, we had eight and a half, nine hour Ironman athletes, you know, age group Ironman athletes going 12 hours out there. So there's definitely a difference in competing at this time of year versus, you know, and and this is something we have to learn. If we're going to do an earlier championship like this, that volume has to start back in, you know, November, December. Well, but we decided not to, because we still have the championship in October. Exactly. So So it's hard not to do two full peaks and two full, uh, you know, uh, season preparations. So, um, forego this one for the big one in, in October. But mm-hmm. to Emma Kate's point, that's likely the case of early season racing for most uh, most in the uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. And I do, I do think, Jim, that that's probably part of the reason, you know, you're asking what, what do you think distinguishes the people who did well uh, this weekend and the people who maybe suffered. And I think they, going back over the past six months or, or, or more, maybe they've made that decision with their coach or their team Hey, we're going to focus on St. George and we're going to, and that means that November and December and January are going to be not off season or not, or not post season or not just a uh, low volume and, oh, sorry, volume and aerobic training. This is going to be like, we're prepping, we're prepping for a, a key race in, in May. So then, but that, like you say, that then begs the question, what happens, what happens in October? You yeah. Know? Well, I think another another downfall was Ironman invited so many athletes, you know, three, four months ago, and that's, for a course like this, that's not enough time to train, but they were trying to, you know, just fill seats in the yeah, race. So, yeah. yeah. Emily, what do you got? I just think, I think it will be interesting because this is the first year that we've ever had um, where we're going to see a world championship in May. And then there's five months of racing in between. You're going to have people doing Roth, doing, you know, these pro-ams um, through PTO, like, Hawaii could look very different, um, depending on how people handle this neck, this interim four to five months. Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting and people are going to have to make some decisions because you just can't do it all. Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting. It will be interesting, but you know, so Emma Kate's going to be in Hawaii racing because she's been training like Norwegian. Am I right? DK? <laughs> Yeah, I don't so think she, I'll be racing. Be, I'll be working, but I won't coming, be racing. Coming back into the pro field like Didi um, and kicking some ass out there. But so let's get into our next point that I want to go over with you. So, so you've been a hot topic on Twitter lately because you've been training like a Norwegian with Coach Allen Cousins. And um, I, I want to get in there. I want to touch on that. And like I said, if you don't give away too much, you don't divulge too much, send all these listeners where you want them to be, senttriathlete.com or whatever. But let's give them a little taste of what you've been doing and uh, kind of the training you've been diving into and the results that's been leading to thus far. And, um, and yeah, I mean, if you're going to owe it all to Christian and finish in Kona first place, you know, women's pro, so be it. You know, we'll start calling you with that Norwegian accent, as they used to speak in, uh, ufta, ifta, ufta, isn't that the, oh, that's Swedish. I'm sorry. I combined the two. <laughs> Sweet. We just lost Swedish listeners. So what have you been <laughs> doing? Tell, lost, tell lost us. Scandinavia, I think. Yeah. We'll just put it all lump it in one. All I know is they eat a lot of lefts up there, but, uh, but yeah. So what have you been doing with, uh, Dr. Cousins? We tell him doctor, coach cousins. What have you guys been doing? Uh, over no, there? He's coach cousins. Yeah. So we, the, the idea started as a bit of a, well, yeah, it started as a bit of an editorial team joke back in, obviously there's been a lot in endurance press. Wait, 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 wait. Can we, can I interrupt here? So you have yourself, you have Chris Foster, you have Brad Culp writing for you. Who else is writing for you? Who else is on your editorial the, team? The editorial, the editorial team, the editors as such is uh, Kelly Omar is the editor in chief. Oh, Omar, I forgot Kelly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Chris Foster, myself and Susan Lack. So why aren't you guys why aren't you guys commentating races like between all the personalities and information you guys have let's get you guys commentating races and obviously oh, myself own, yeah 
we do myself hot rod and emily can jump in and add a little color you know you guys can do your straight edge this is what's happening with lytle here and then we'll come in and add a little color commentary done and done all right so go ahead i'm sorry but, um, anyway it started as an edit team a bit of a joke we there was obviously there's obviously been over the last uh, well year or more there's been so much in the endurance media sports media about the norwegians and you know, not just um triathlon but uh it, you know in the winter sports and uh we were we were debating and some of the one of the big papers came out in or i think it was like around january february time which um i was reading and we were debating like what would happen if you put an age grouper onto uh you know a, a stand, let's try and find a standard standard you know uh i say i'm saying quote unquote standard but uh, age grouper and, and put them on the norwegian training program um and or, or, or let them and have them follow the training protocol and see what happens um, because, and I, I guess I should sort of preface that by saying we were calling, we, we, when we say Norwegian training, we're, talk, we're talking about like double threshold, day, double, double threshold workout days um, and having a lot of the, a lot of the work, actual volume each week be pretty low intensity, like way, way lower than I think I've ever been used to. Um, and so I reached out to Alan Cousins and because I knew he was also quite an advocate of that approach, uh, that way of training. And we thrashed the idea around a little bit and we decided that it would be, we wanted to, to make sure the person who was following the experiment, who was following the training was super invested. So we wanted to, so basically I, I ended up being the guinea pig in the middle of the, uh, the experiment. And uh, that was, I started the program back in March, early March. And I'm still, I'm, I'll probably finish it around the end of May. So just March. let's touch on what that protocol is again. So what is, what kind of does the, what does a training week look like? For you right now uh, there's two or three days a week where i have double run days and at the moment two of those three double run days both have intensity am and pm um and then there's a long a long run on a sunday which is very very easy when i first started out i couldn't it was i found it hard to run that slowly which i know sounds sounds funny but monday so but i can run you through the week if you like so monday is like an easy recovery day I actually usually just do yoga on a Monday uh, or, or a swim. And then Tuesday's a double run day. Uh, Wednesday, I typically do strength in the morning and there's either a ride or a light run in the afternoon. And then Thursday's another double run day. Friday's a ride or a swim or both, depending on work, schedule, that kind of thing. Saturday's a double run day, both, both, uh, both intensity. And Sunday's a long, long, easy, easy run uh, with some strength work in the afternoon. But you're, you're focused on a run you know, you're focused on a run race at the end of May, right? Yep. So would this vary right. if you were, if you were yes. Blumenfeld yeah. or Eden or is, somebody? Of course. Yeah. We don't, I should, yeah, I should preface this by saying like, I, of all the, of the three sports that I've carried on most consistently since I've retired, running is the, is, is the one just partly because it's the easier, most time effective way to, I think, to stay fit. Um, so we decided we keep it run focused because that's where my, I was pretty deconditioned when I started the experiment, but my run fitness was better than the, my swim and bike. So, um, yeah. And so they'll, we, we were, we were gearing it towards doing a 10 K or a half marathon at the end of the experiment. Jared, what are you hearing here? Uh, recovery days sound similar. Uh, intensity days sound similar. Um, I'd like to see the sessions, So I'd like to hear more of the detail of the sessions. Uh, you know, it's funny. You know what I'm hearing? Remember we did our three week intensive tower 26 swim camp back in back at TriFit. God, how many years ago? 2008. Yep. Yeah. 14 years ago. Now we were doing, I mean, we do morning, evening intensity and I never came out of those. And we obviously balanced it out with steady swimming, easy runs, things like that. But the focus was those intensity days. And I never came out of that feeling better than I had. And I, you know, won a couple big races coming out of the, those, that three week, intense swim intensive intensive uh sessions so yeah i guess the the key thing for that for the norwegians and the one thing that we've tried to be pretty clear and, and pretty precise on as precise as you can be is the lactate testing uh because they test they test every almost every like all their all their key sessions they, they're doing lactate testing for every session and so we did lactate testing in week two to get my baseline readings and then um I'm obviously not doing lactate testing every session on my on my training protocol, but uh, we have a very small window of heart rate, a small heart rate window that I have to keep the intensity around and don't go above it. It's very important to not go above it. Um, so, if, and for me, that's like heart rate my, for running. My that that heart rate range is like one four six, one four nine. 
And so if I'm feeling good at the track, it's very easy for me to then like just crank it into the 150s. But then that's where the just that little bit of extra lactate production will obviously impede recovery from so you, so it prevents you say, say I do that on a Thursday night that then then obviously impedes recovery for going into Saturday's double run where I might have double track session on Saturday so um, yeah that's the one thing I'd say it, and, and I know having spoken to the Norwegian team coaches over the past week that's one of the things that they're pretty um pretty tight on so you spent a, you spent a good amount of time with them this last week and you actually broke the story that Eden wasn't going to race because he was sick am I right Yes, that's yeah, right. You're, like the, yeah. you're the TMZ of triathlon over here. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. I got in from a I got in from a run, and I had a text message from Olaf Bu, who's uh, the head coach of Christian and uh, Gustav. And it was funny. He was he like giving me all this information. The text message was like this long block, and it was like all this information about Christian's bike, which that that was a story that we um, that had obviously been like the hot topic for the whole week. Everybody's like, what what is that bike he's riding? Anyway, he gives me this long message about all of Christian's bikes, like things I'd asked about Christian's bike. And then at the bottom, it's like, oh, and Gustav's not going to start tomorrow. Yeah, and just I was by like, the way. You buried, you buried the lead there, guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, but yeah, so we, um, within about uh, 30, 40 minutes, we had that story up on the website and it, it the analytics behind that story were fascinating to watch. Like it blew up. Huge. So, yeah. be, so having spent time with them, in addition to breaking all this hot, hot, hot news, what did you learn being in that Norwegian environment for the week? Oh, I mean, yeah, no, to be clear, like I, suspe- I spent some of uh, Wednesday of race week with them over at their, and their um, accommodation in um, St. George. And that was, and so, yeah, just to see, yeah, to see their kind of operation and what they're, what they're doing. I think, uh, as I, as I mentioned just before we came on air, I think uh, it's kind of next level. It's, very different to what anybody else is doing in in triathlon at the moment the level of lab lab work analysis uh the knowledge of physiology uh it's it's beyond it's, it's, it's way above and beyond anything that anybody else is is doing Do they have like a special pair of underwear they all wear or is there anything that's like secret like super secret like top secret good luck well i think that mustache that um gustav had was part, probably part of it right yeah yeah i'd say so emily your your head's bouncing all over the place what do you want to say I just, I think, I mean, like they obviously do have a lot of um, ability to track all these things like physiologically that like amateur athletes are not going to have. But I think if you want to pick one main thing out of their program, like when they're talking about intensity and as Emma Kate was saying, it's very dialed and it is very in control. And I think it's less intensity than people really think like they it's, it's easier intensity than you would expect, I think. Yes. And, and there, like, I see a lot of, I'm just going to throw my observations sometimes of when you see pros and they post their training. Um, like, they're like, I ran 16 miles at race pace. And like, it might be their dream race pace. And like, I would love to see what their lactate was when they did that work. Because when Christian does his 30 K run the Sunday before the race guarantee you, like, that's legitimately his race pace and his lactate, you know, when they test his lactate, it's low as it should be. Um, so I think, so he legit knows like what he can do in that, you know, in that environment and everything. So I think that a lot of people think their race pace is sometimes something it's not. <laughs> well, I just, yeah. EK, what I re- what did I just read? You went out for a run and you were trying to keep your heart rate like 115. And I mean, think about if you guys, I mean, standing up from that chair, hot rod, your heart rate's going to go above 115 to go out and run and try and keep your heart rate at what is it? 115 to 124. I think you said, I mean, that must take insane focus to to keep it there. Yes. So that was funny. Like the first Sunday long run I did, I always run with, I almost always run with uh, my friend, Rachel Joyce. We do a lot of our long runs together and it's often time, like a time where we both catch up. And we're just like, we run for 90 minutes, two hours. We're just catching up on our weeks and just, you know. And um, that first Sunday, I said, I did warn her. I was like, hey, I've got to keep my heart rate 115, 120. So, and it's been a long time since I've been a slave to, to too, many, too many metrics. Um, and I was, we were walking and, and uh, you know, like kind of almost shuffling at times. And yeah. then we both had sore quads the next day because it was just like, you're running in a way that you're not used to running. But actually within a couple of weeks, I, I learned like my cadence, I just had to pick my cadence up a lot and I had to, yeah just and then obviously as you as we know the body adapts pretty quickly especially when you've got a big endurance base so within a couple weeks i was 
that, that, that was starting to get a lot um, more manageable. I mean, much. that's the, that's the epitome of patience. You know, it's like, you got to trust the process, stick with it. You see the body adapt and then you see the fruits of your labor. But if you don't trust the process, you're like, Oh, screw it. I'm just going to go. You'll never, you'll never see reap the rewards that, that they're going to be able to be reaped. I guess you could say. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it is that, it is that um, patient, like you say, patience and that um, commitment to, to the program and like knowing that working at that really low level is going to yield um, the fruit, but it's going to be, it's going to be a slow process. Like we know, as we know, like you have to be patient. You have to, you have to like, c- yeah, commit to it. Um, and, but going back to Emily's point earlier about the, the intensity not being what a lot of people, you know, people think, when people think of um, threshold, they, I mean, it's a nebulous term anyway, like, you know, it's, it's thrown around very easily, but um, the, the, the work that we're doing or work that they do, like that second LT2 marker, like the second, your second lactate threshold, that point at which before, like, obviously uh, lactate just goes wild in your body and really starts to slow you down, like keeping it below that, keeping it below that LT2 marker, keeping your work, like keeping your heart rate, keeping the workload intensity at that point, is what enables you to keep going back to that place and back it up. And as we know, like consistency is like the cornerstone of endurance training. And so ha- being able to back up all that training at just under LT2 means that you are like logging super really, really good inten- intensity that isn't crippling you and causing you to fatigue and not be able to train well the next day. So yeah. that, and that's, that's exactly what Emily was saying just then. So yeah, it's the, that's the, that is the key to it. Not going and killing yourself and running at dream race pace and yeah, yeah. making your Instagram look good. So Jim, a, a question for you. Is Me. this, well, I guess to you and, uh, and uh, EK, is this really revolutionary? I mean, it, no. you're, you're, you're no. sort of making this sound, both of you guys, like what the, the Norwegians are doing is something, and, and, and I'll quote your words, uh, Emma Kate, uh, next level is this really next it's level? not revolutionary chair but it, enough people don't realize that you need to make your easy days easy so the hard days can be hard within the scope of hard right like okay you can't just go was, race a race a half marathon as hard as you can every saturday because the rest of the week you're going to be totally freaking crushed. Well, we know there are athletes where they are certain iron man athletes uh, that do that that i don't think has ever been well recommended by many folks but um I looked at the race, Emma Kate, the entire race, right? Uh, men's field, women's field. I followed uh, the, the feed live. And um, I was, and again, so I'm not there, but, but I'm, I'm taking in the, you know, what I'm seeing from multiple hours. I was very impressed, very impressed by the patience of the, the, the men and women. And now, of course, the feed is just showing the professional athletes, right? Mm. Uh, of both male and female, their patience on the bike. I felt, and let's start with Lionel Sanders, since you brought the name up and having coached him for a number of years and I know the personality, I thought he was extremely patient, savvy in how he, he, he uh, managed his, um, you know, dispensed his, his effort. I thought that to be the case, even with uh, Cam Worf, uh, who can ha- have easily gone out much harder if he wanted to, it seemed like. On many of the athletes, I thought this was uh, what Christian was doing uh, what I could observe he was doing was no different than what many others were doing. It seems like this was a fairly well managed, carefully managed, uh, you know, dosing of efforts, knowing that, um, you know, the bike got pretty tough towards the end. Right. And, uh, and you had all the elevation then. So I, I'm not sure if this is really next level you just happen to yeah. have a, a couple of norwegians doing really well at this moment no different than back in the 90s and into the uh, end of the 90s and so on and into the 2000s you had the germans doing really well is it next level really yeah no i would i would say that you've actually connected dots that i wasn't connecting there um and i i i'm not calling the, their training methodology next level i'm calling okay. I, their, their training methodology yeah parts of it and large parts of it have definitely been around since the 80s or early 90s right we you know polarized training and the rest of it um what i am calling next level is the is the the backroom staff and resources and physiological like the x fears they have going on behind the scenes that's next level that's not it's kind of like world tour cycling level you know and i don't think they're and what i was saying is next level was i don't think we have that many pro- professional triathletes with access to that level of exercise physiology knowledge research testing 
that's next level. The training protocol is catching a lot of attention because like you say, we have this, we have two of them doing extremely well and they're very, very inexperienced relative to most of the field. They're very, very uh, inexperienced Ironman races. Ironman athletes, correct. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think the training protocol isn't next level. The training protocol is what they're doing. It's catching a lot of attention because their results are phenomenal. Um, I well, think. Yeah, that's what, what we I, I, think, to... I think what they have going on behind the scenes is next level. Okay. Yeah. All right, Jerry. I, I need we... you. I need you to invest in the stuff going in behind the scenes. Can we get some of those, um, some of that data analysis stuff? I don't. I can't run it, but maybe Emily can do it. Sure. Why not? Uh, <laughs> do that. You know, I, I, I found uh, Emma Kate near in the media, obviously, that the media tends to, I, I remember back in the 90s with uh, when Michael Johnson won the 200 and the 400, was it, am I correct, the 200 and the 400 at the, at the Olympics, uh, 200 meters, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. and 400 at the Atlantic Games, he had yeah. a very unusual running style. Uh, you know, more erect, almost slightly leaning back. And it was, okay, this is the new thing. This is what's going to make you fast to run this particular way. Well, no, that was his style worked for him. And, and whatever the, the winning athletes are doing seems to be this new thing. But uh, I'm, I'm glad you're able to clarify the difference between what's new and, and, and perhaps using your words, the background um, testing in this case. Uh, Jim, this will make guys like Gareth Thomas very happy, right? Jer, you're trying to you're trying to put Emma Kate out of business. Like if she didn't even no, write her, she couldn't put anything. No, no, no. She needs to write something. There's, there's <laughs> just a go lot. Trim. No, I, just I go get, do it, I, whatever you're doing before. Do it again. She needs a hot topic. Going. She's the TMZ of tra of triathlons. She needs to have something to talk about here, Jer. There's no, no, I get Jerry's point. About. There's like there's a lot of me there's a lot of media hype around the Norwegians, and they've partly created that. Partly, yes. you know, that's a combination of factors. Their results have partly created that. Uh, the way they are, which is quite different to a lot of professional triathletes, especially what they put out on social media is, is, is one of those things. And it's interesting. It's um, so it does catch attention. And then there is this like, as they call it, the Norwegian hype train, you know, like, it, yeah. and we've all, we've all jumped on it and we we're all like, choo choo, here we go. At least so, we, have a response, we have a responsibility, Jim, um, amongst ourselves, we could talk this stuff, but we also have many listeners listening to this. And I want to make sure that there's an understanding uh, 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 that, you know that what's being done some of you guys that are listening out there your coaches are telling you to do some of these things so just keep following what your coaches are telling you this is not like emily shaking her head there this is not next level stuff to some we extent should, we should just call it the rodriguez method that's what i'm calling oh, it. <laughs> the rodriguez method. No, it's hard i get wrestling. it you're right it's not revolutionary i get it's totally not revolutionary get it. but it's, inter it's interesting and in a sport that is sometimes lacks the the color and the characters that we all need it we want it to yes. have like it it's a grabbing attention and it's grabbing it's engaging and and i think um yeah here's what chicken, i like about chicken this and egg, chicken and egg a little bit too right because Here, it's like here's what i like about this emma kate this uh you know hamster that's been moving along on the treadmill right that's gotten all the attention has gotten lionel sanders to actually pay attention to a coach for the first time in years Yes. And it seems like follow a prescription that taught him to race more um, carefully and be more in control of his racing than how he's perhaps raced in the past. Now, let's distinguish for a moment. I mean, we, you know, the, the, the common talk, you listen to every feed, uh, Jim, right, that Lionel doesn't pay attention to any coaches. Let's be clear on this. When Lionel was coached by us, he paid attention. He just never went through an entire season. He would go through four or five months and he's off doing whatever he wants to do. Uh, you know, he would drop off being on our plan and then go do whatever Lionel does. But he would come back each year and do the same thing. It seems like this may be the first time he's actually stuck with a coach and listened to what they had to say for the entire period of time, it appears, because certainly his racing format is different than what I've observed uh, for the prior five years, hence an outcome that's very quite outstanding, right? In the last two races, at least. Yeah, I mean, look at his look at his form the last two races. I mean, for sure. Yeah. I think and the let, me, let me tie it back in. He's been coached by Eden's yes. brother. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, Which yes. is a Norwegian. And they were very, yes. and they were also very. Gustav Eden was very quick to say that he Lionel fits into their training cohort extremely well, and they only invite people in who they think are going to to fit and and bring it and bring everybody. Uh, you know, it's like what what helps. Brett, What's the, what's the phrase? What makes the boat go, what, what's going to help make the boat go faster? It's like, who's going to lift us? Or who do we bring in to lift us all up? You know, all, you know quite a socialist kind of very community led kind of um, feel to it. 
And Gustav said, we, we knew Lionel, we thought Lionel would be a great fit for us. We'd never, we'd never invite Jan Fredino, but we'd invite, we invited Lionel. And oh, there's a TMZ story for you, <laughs> Jim. Oh, I've, I've let that one out of the bag. I haven't even put it on traffic.com yet. You've got an exclusive <laughs> from the exclusive. Well, I, I, I more caught on her just calling Lionel socialist. So I don't know about you, <laughs> but that's what I heard. <laughs> he is Canadian. Uh, Emily, what do you got? <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think Lionel, admits like it took me 10 years to finally listen to someone and you know if you look at his race splits I mean he had like the second or third fastest bike so it's not like he didn't ride it's well how he did it it's how he it's did how it. he did it he yes. let the group go at the beginning and didn't burn matches and they came back to him mm -hmm. and I think having that trust and that confidence is like it's just gonna it's just gonna build on itself like fitness because he's he's executing these races and he's finishing well and like there's nothing like finishing a race well and passing people at the end that gives you like so much confidence and makes it so fun. Oh, but Emily, the, the what's word? the quote? What's the quote, Emily? What's you can't. You can't. There's no race day magic that help lets you outperform your physiology. There, there it go. is. Two shows in a row. She's used that one. But you, I'll tell you what. The, I'll tell you what the worst feeling in the world is. Making that final turn with at your twenty five point five in a marathon. You have six tenths to go, and you see someone that you know you can catch, but you're in like the ultimate pain cave. But you're like, I, I know I can put in this effort and catch this person, but I know how much it's going to hurt. And Lionel did that, and I was just looking at him, knowing that exact feeling. You're like. I know I can catch this person, but this pain that it's going to take, do I really want to go there? He's obviously, he wanted to go there and he made the pass, oh. but we all can, we all feel that pain. You know, you're, you know, exactly. You see in the crosshairs and you're like, oh, this is going to be horrible, but I got to do it. I got to say, and I think, I think, for, sorry, I'm going to go. No, I was just going to say, and poor Braden Curry couldn't pick up his feet. No I way. mean, yeah, but go ahead. Sorry, Emma Kate. Um, no, I think that point you're saying about, uh, Jim, about you're saying like you see somebody up the road, you know, you can catch them, but you're in so much pain. I think some athletes, especially athletes of Lionel's caliber, that isn't even a conscious thought. Like that's a decision that's, that's made. It's already yeah. done. And I think Jerry would know, probably agree with me too. Like with Lionel, like it would be like, that isn't a, that's going to hurt, but that's happening. Like that is going to happen. I am going to chase that yeah. guy down. Yeah. But in, in, you can see that in Oceanside too, where he raced. Um, but I think what we're seeing with Lionel is I think he's probably one of those athletes. Um, I don't know him well, but from what I can see of him and know of his background, I think he's one of those athletes that probably takes a lot of confidence from all the physiology testing and the data and like you know, knowing that he can, you know, he can look at his data, look at his metrics on the bike, on the run, knowing that he, they've tested him, they've, they've told him you can, you can ride at this, at this, um, at this speed, this watts, this heart rate for X number of minutes miles and you're going to be okay this and the same the same on the run i think it seems like he's taking confidence i i i'm completely surmising but i think he's taking confidence from some of that what it will be interesting with line and knowing the personality very well is if he can mm -hmm. stick with the plan for the next five or six months through right. kona because yeah. that's what he's from my observations with any coach that i'm aware of he's been with he hasn't done so we shall going, see. I know our, see. our TMZ reporter will be on top of it. So if he shows up to Kona the way he showed up to St. George, uh, I think, yeah, watch out, watch out. And like you say, if he stays, like Jerry says, if he stays on the program, if he stays consistent, if he stays like, like committed to it, I think, um, yeah, I saw him at an event on Thursday evening and he just looked so relaxed. He was really funny. He was just like, he was just hanging he out were, with people and he just. He reminds me of, you remember Lenny Kreiselberg? Mm -hmm. the uh the swimmer they have the same demeanor before events they're just at this total calm down level it's the, all the hype that goes around them has no impact whatsoever on yeah. them, yeah. which gets them really ready for the moment that gun goes off beautiful well, we got a lot of good info here ek remember if anybody, if anybody wants to find you go try athlete mag you have a ton of different info on there if you want to follow the process and the norwegian training method and see how you Thanks. perform in your race and then the may triathlete mag is gonna have all that info am i right so the latest issue of uh, Triathlete has the, the first feature. Uh, it has a 10-page feature on the Train Like a Norwegian protocol. That's the uh, May-June issue that came out at the start of, uh, start of the month, well, a couple of weeks ago. And then triathlete.com, uh, you'll, find all the, you'll find all of our St. George coverage, and you'll find um, more stories about the Norwegian um, experiment coming up. Your Instagram, EK Lidbury, anywhere else they can find you or anywhere else, the Triathlete, triathlete 
podcast, uh, anywhere else that people so can have, find you? Uh, we have Try Feet Fitter and Faster podcast, which is monthly. And um, I've also been posting all of my workouts on Strava during this, um, during, during this uh, Norwegian experiment. So that's been fun. Awesome. A lot of good info here. We will, uh, we'll get this up and it's always a pleasure having you on. I know you got to run, but, uh, it's great. You're always welcome on, on the airwaves here. It's always a fun conversation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all. It was great to see you. All EK, right. EK, before we'll you run, you. Jim, yep. could I ask you one final clarification? Yes, uh-huh. it is a bestseller. It's a bestseller. Gonna, Jared. Just, he's got me it. on the, he's, cause it's going to throw me on the ropes. Watch out, watch out. No, no, no. It's all good. I, I want to make sure that for our audience, it's clarified that when yes. you're doing your two it seemed like twice a week, at least two intensive days of runs. Yeah. That prescription is based upon also your background of running that you did have a platform of as a professional yes. athlete. Oh, running. Yeah. And if somebody else without MK's background, that may not be their prescription to start off. Right. Yeah. And also okay. I should, I should add, like I, we started out, I was very clear with Alan when we started out on the program, like I didn't have much more than 10 or 12 hours a week to train. I don't, I, I don't have that much time to train anymore. Um, and, uh, we did it all of the workouts since week two have been based off of the lactate testing that we did. We did an extensive lactate testing session, seven, one mile repeats on the track. We did that at the end of week two and all of the workouts since then have been based on that data. And I'm also doing, um, one of the things that we're leaning on quite heavily is, uh, the HRV heart rate variability monitoring. So like my levels of fatigue and you know, resting heart rate and heart rate variability figures are uh, automatically uploaded to my training peaks every morning. And so he pulls me back if, you know, we've tweaked things when, when fatigue or um, stress has been creeping in and polluting kind of the, 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 the numbers that we want to see. So um, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't, uh, yeah, for sure. Like, the let's load be prescribed to you is based upon your, partly based on also your athletic background. Yes, you may have been deconditioned, but this is not where you would start somebody that's a, because we have many listeners here that are beginners in the sport and this is not where they would start off. Yeah, I would definitely say if you're going to do something like this, you obviously want to have a big aerobic aerobic base. You know, like this is not something just to jump into. Uh, I would do it with the help of a coach who's well-qualified and experienced and yeah, like as with any kind of training, be very, very careful. So yeah, I'm definitely not advocating. Um, it's fun to talk about it from the point of view of an athlete with close to 20 years experience of endurance training. Um, but I definitely wouldn't advocate it for somebody who's coming into the sport and still learning. So disclaimer, that's what we call disclaimer. Yes, you, we, are in the, always... we are in the United States. It's, it's, uh, You've got to be careful, haven't you? Okay, Emily. I have one last question. Are the Norwegians, um, are they bringing any women into their training group you know they did say they they did have uh they did talk about lisa norden they've been training with lisa and they'd really enjoyed training with lisa but i mm-hmm. don't they didn't mention anybody else um except for yourself i mean didn't we already say i Kona? wouldn't i wouldn't, I wouldn't hang i wouldn't hang for very long <laughs> i thought we already said we already we have a kona winner right here you said it yourself earlier in the show i can play it back we could play it again i said no. play sorry. that for me i got my producer he's gonna play the clip that <laughs> you said you're gonna win kona in uh, october so future Kona winner. I'll tell, you what I might win. I'll tell you what I might win. I might win the beer mile in Kona, but that's about hey, it. Hey, you know what? You're on. Going for it. Male <laughs> and female champion right here on the Tower 26B Race Fair Podcast. All right, go. I know you got to go. Take it easy. We'll see you. You guys want to reach out to Emma Kate, reach out through Instagram or uh, Twitter or whatever. And uh, you're always welcome on these airwaves. Thanks, Emma. Emma Thank Kate. you. See you. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank Keep you. up the good work. Great. Interesting stuff, guys. Interesting stuff. Hot topics. Hot topics. Jerry? Good call. I'm glad. Good call. I'm glad you did this. It was good, uh, good info. And uh, Emily, I appreciate you hopping in. And and um, I just want to make sure that our audience understands that. That's no, great. This you is can't just jump in with both feet. That's how injury happens. Mm-hmm. We get too many athletes injured as it is. So yeah. I th- I think the underlying thing of this is listen to your coach. Don't go too hard all the time. And, and, and the thing that underlines that is listen to your coach and patience. I mean, that's just, it. it's years and years, it's years and years. And like, well, if you aren't ready for that and you don't love the training and that type of progression, you know, that's, well, that's what it is. You found coaches that have a seasoned background and, and are, you know, knowledgeable of what they're doing. And one of the things, Jim, as you know, Emily, you see this, well, Emily, you have a perfect example of, of excellence at this. When you get a coach that's good, you keep them, right? Mm-hmm. You don't change coaches. I mean, I think you've been with, I've been with your coach for close to a decade. Is that correct? 
Yep. Yes. So you just don't, in this sport, coaches are changed rather frequently. Yep. It's my experience with other sports. Yes, they are. That's discussion for another podcast. This yes, one, sir. before we get to the coat, to our, our workout of the episode, let's talk about the Santa Barbara Triathlon, Jer. It's happening again. It's a two-day format. On Saturday, August 27th, we have the long course individual race, which is, do you know the distances of this race? What's the long course in Santa Barbara? It's our, it's the own, it's its own distance. Do you why remember you what it tell, is? Why don't you, it's you, a one, one mile swim in the beautiful, pristine, calm waters of the Pacific Ocean. There's no Flat. waves, nothing. Flat. One mile swim. This is the long course individual. One mile swim, 34 mile bike ride amongst the beautiful scenery of Santa Barbara County. And then a 10 mile run along the ocean front. Some challenging hills towards the back half. So it's not just a total flat run. You're going to get a challenge. It's a very strong field. A lot of beginners up the professionals. We have, we have it all at the Santa Barbara Triathlon. August 27th is going to have that long course individual. You can have your youth race. You can have your relay teams. You have your aqua bike. And then the second day, August, uh, August 28th, you have the short course co-ed race, the women only race and the parent and child race. So you could race on Saturday in that individual race and do your parent child race on Sunday, make a whole family weekend of it. Come the beautiful wine country and, um, and enjoy the weekend of racing August 27th to 28th. Remember guys go to Santa Barbara before midnight on May 16th and get 10% off your entry freeze fees. So I will be the announcer. I'll call you guys across the finish line, both Saturday and Sunday, August 27th and 28th, get 10% off by signing up before May 16th. Right now, as we are recording, it's May 9th. So you guys have exactly seven days to sign up for that race. So we'll see you guys out there, August 27th and 27th, 28th of 2022 jerry let's get to the workout of the episode go to coaching.tower26.com for all the details of this workout jerry what is the workout today emily if you want to pipe in you can pipe in on the workout as well yeah emily you know you know prepared the workout and um you know it's one that we use every year at this time right before we get ready to redo our time trial our 1k and 100 so it's a session that helps you manage or carefully manage efforts or output no differently than we were just talking about with the athletes being smart and careful on the, uh, especially in the first half of the bike ride. So here, given that we're going to be doing a 1K uh, time trial, we started off, uh, we had a warm up and so on. You can go to the coaching website to see what the warm up is, but the main set was rather simple. It was two times 1,000. And the first 1,000 was broken into 10 100s, okay? 10 to 15 seconds rest, I believe. And what we had our athletes do was progress effort gently, start off super easy, and then gently progress effort till by number six or seven, you would have uh, risen to the effort that you will be able to sustain for an entire 1000. So let's say, Jim, you felt you were going to be able to hold, let's make, make it easy math, a minute per hundred. Okay. So you would start off with 108, then Obviously, 106, then yeah. 104. Yes. Then you'd get to a minute per hundred, and then you'd hold that at number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, just sustaining that effort, just dialing it in. Then we took a break, did a little bit of easy swimming, and then we came back to make sure that that minute was your time, was your correct pacing. We then did 100, followed by a 200, followed by a 300, followed by a 400, with obviously rests in between. And that first 100 should be a minute in this example. The 200 should be two minutes. The 300 should be three minutes. Now, if by the time you got to the 300 of this example, you can't hold that 60 second speed per hundred. Now that's a very fast pace, but it's just for easy math and discussion. Uh, then we know that you established a, a pace on your, when you're doing the set of 100, just perhaps too fast or too hard for you to sustain. And certainly when you went to the 400, if you slipped even further again, then we know that the pace is too hot for you. So you get to make some adjustments before we go into actually uh, going to, um, you know, the, the race day where we're doing the one. And so you really, it's a rehearsal. You really hate this freaking workout. If you don't pace it correctly, you do it a couple of times and you start to learn, Hey, this is my realistic pace. It's actually really manageable. Cause you're supposed to do a thousand at that pace. If you can't hold on to that pace for 200, 300, 400, it's a miserable workout. Yeah. It, and it's simply about learning because many athletes who come into the sport, especially new athletes don't really have a good sense of, um, of pacing it's easy to sort of uh emily uses this word a lot cook yourself too soon um and you know you go out you swim that first 100 and uh rather than do if you're a 145 per 100 swimmer and you swam the first 100 and 132 because it just felt easy to do it well then it goes to 137 then pretty quickly at 145 and then because you went 132 on the first one then you start slipping to 150s 
So we don't want to, do, that's the way the formula for failure is not how we want to do it. It's a great so session. It's all about careful preparation. Careful preparation, coaching.tower26.com. Go sign up there, go see the workout, get all the details and, uh, you know, try it for yourself and be real, be realistic with those paces. Emily, any notes on that one? No, I, I totally agree with Jerry. It's like that first 100 that you do when you're doing the 100, 200, 300, 400 build, like it should feel really in control because you got to double it and then triple it and then quadruple it. So if you're already kind of like maxing out a little bit on that 100, it's just your effort level is going to raise on every time you swim longer. So um, it should feel manageable and sustainable. Yep. And you know, Jim, one of the things uh, that we forget to mention each time we talk about these things is athletes, you, you go on the water and then they press their watch. So that's a half a second benefit, okay? Then you swim and as you're coming into the wall, you see them coming in and before they touch the wall, their hands go into the watch and they're stopping the watch. So they benefited a second, a half a second at the push off um, because they didn't start it, start the watch at the exact movement at, at be initially beginning. And then the, the watch is being stopped even before your hand touches the wall. And then in a continuous swim, you have to touch the wall, turn and then push off. So that adds time on. So don't be too eager to try and get... Uh, uh, quick pacing for that 100 be very very exact in the sense of make sure you it's you the elapsed time is the entire time from the time you get ready to push off the wall to when your hand touches the wall and then you can touch your watch oh, come on we have egos chair we can't do all that we have egos in, i need to be as short as possible in this phase i go i go two be... seconds after i press off the wall to two seconds before i touch the wall that's my time in this phase, we're not supposed to be using our our uh, um, watches in the pool. Actually, if be unless like you don't be like Blumenfeld, take it off four tenths of a mile from. The Use your line. pace clock. If if you don't have a pace clock, I understand you might need your watch. But uh, when I didn't have a pace clock at a pool, I used to just put a digital, like old Timex digital watch. I'd strap it onto my water bottle and leave it running. That's it. It's that easy. All right, good. Beat the dead horse there. We're good. We're on to the next thing. Contact the tower26.com. Write in your questions. We've been getting a lot of questions with this upped and up frequency of our podcast. People want questions answered, guys. So our first question is from our former local swimmer, now a subscription swimmer since she moved away, Carla Weir. Remember Carla, Jer? Of course. Carla writes in, I am on the swim subscription program, but I am only focused on Olympic distance triathlons. Should I be modifying down the subscription workouts being that I'm only focused on Olympic distance triathlons? What do you think, Jim? I don't think so. I don't, I think we need to get in that volume. You need to get in that intensity. So you're over-prepared. Yeah, we're going to, you're going to go into a half ready to rip a half, but if you're ready for a half and you go to Olympic, that means you're going to reach that next level because you were so prepared for that distance. And the reason for that is, and especially for Carla and those that Carla would represent, which, which are any uh, athletes that are non-competitive swimmers. So Emily, for instance, and your former teammate, Andy Potts, these are super elite swimmers. They're not going to have to do, uh, they, they already have such a substantial background that they can sort of trim sets uh, if they're only doing an Olympic distance. But everybody else who didn't have that background, you're still building up. You have years of specific muscle endurance power uh, to build. So no, don't trim the sessions. And if you don't have the time to get the whole session as session, where should it be trimmed from? Never trim any portion of the main set. Trim anything else you want, but never the main set. Period. Period. Done. Proclamation. In other words, never if you the only main set. 45 minutes on the main sets, 45 minutes, start with it. There you go. All right. Next question is from Abigail. Hey, I'm thinking about joining the Tower 26 swim program. I'm a bit overwhelmed. This is a local swimmer. I'm a bit overwhelmed. And this is good because it's for all you master swimmers out there. I'm thinking about joining the Tower 26 local swim program. I'm a bit overwhelmed since I'm just trying to get my bearings as to what master swimming entails. I haven't swam laps since I was a kid. So probably over 20 years, I wouldn't even know where to begin or if I can even swim as long as you guys go. And for gear, is it essential for the training from the get-go to get or something you can get as you progress? Thanks, Abigail. 
Yeah, Mabigail, thanks for the question. Two things, uh, two questions you asked there. Uh, gear, let's answer that first. Yes, go get the gear immediately because we use that in the sessions and there, there are reasons we use that, technical reasons to help improve your mechanics and so on. So yes, you don't want to skip or delay getting the gear. Regarding um, integrating into the session, uh, I would say, Jim, Emily, probably over 90% of our athletes are started, have started our program where Al Abigail is about to start. They did not have a background. Uh, they didn't even swim laps like Ab 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 Abigail did prior. They are at, were, were at one point absolute beginners. So that's why we have those first three weeks, you know, those first 10 sessions, we call those the adaptive sessions. It just takes about 10 times to get adapted, to get familiar. Yes, it's gonna be a little overwhelming initially because you probably haven't swam. Uh, if you weren't in the group, you wouldn't swim as much as you would as, as you would in the group. So you may as well start with the group. Uh, the coach will also help you um, uh, have some oversight for you, tell you if, uh, if you can stop the session early, uh, encourage you where to stop and, and so on. But yes, anyone that can swim a total of 200 yards continuously or 200 meters, that's eight lengths of a 25 yard pool, continuously without stopping, can join any coached session that we have. Very well said. We'll see you on deck soon, Abigail. And our last comment, comment came through Twitter. See, this is how we know we're becoming big time because people are tweeting at me about the show, at Jim Lubinsky. They're tweeting at me. Kyle Lennonbauer wrote, hey, I was listening to the last episode, but I couldn't hear too well what Jerry, Jerry was saying. His volume was a little low and I had a lot of background noise. Jerry, can you turn up your speaker volume? Good luck with the baby, Jim. All right, Kyle. We uh, addressed that. that. Yes, <laughs> we, we it's my that. fault. It's my fault. I did not hear it on the last show. I went through and I upped the volume manually. So if you were listening to the last show and you downloaded the first on the first day, Jerry's volume was low. Download again and it's back up. Jerry, my fault. Kyle, I'm glad you pointed it out. Thank you. And we owe Kyle like a swim cap or something because he's the one who pointed it out to me. So Jerry, I, I am apologizing to you. Emily, I'm apologizing to you because it was all my fault. But hey, you want to rag on me at all? At Jim Lubinsky on Twitter. Just let it out there. Air all my dirty laundry. And um, I'm going to send it over to Emma Kate. And she can put it on triathlete.com because I will be the next guest on their podcast, as she said. Jerry? So, so I want to thank you, Jim, for actually making this podcast happen as, as quickly as it did uh, uh, since we just did one a week ago. But you know, being good in, in, in finding Emma Kate, because I think there is good knowledge to learn from what she saw. I, I, and I know we only talked about the pros, but that is a prescription for others to follow because it's the same messaging. It's about consistency. It's about training. It's about being the word that we didn't use, but being fully present in all training sessions. I mean, the Norwegians train, they have a very careful way that they do it, but it's obviously with precision and uh, presence. Yeah, we had a lot of good info here. And that's what, I mean, she was on course. She saw it all. Yeah, she saw the pros, but I thought this is a great one to relate to all those athletes that were out there and all the athletes who are going to be racing, you know, in the upcoming months is when the, is when the meat of the sessions, the meat of the racing happens. So if we can learn from what happened last weekend and build off of that, we're going to have some successful racing coming up in the, in the next few months. So next show, I'm going to try and get some athletes who are actually out racing on course this, uh, this last weekend, get some you know, in the, uh, in the, in the thick of it experience, as well as a ton of other great info. Does that sound acceptable to you guys? I think it's a good one. Yes. We'll see. We'll see when the baby comes. That's all dependent on that, but uh, a lot of good info on this one. Remember guys, follow us on, uh, on Twitter, Instagram, uh, keep subscribing, tell all your friends to subscribe, throw it a like. We look forward to seeing those country lists come out every week because uh, it's a big competition as to who's going to come into the top 10 in those country lists. So Jerry, any final words from you? Thank you as always, Jim. Uh, Emily, we got anything else? No, that was a great show, and um, I'm excited for next week. All right, Megan's there in the in the wing. So for Megan Milgard, Coach Jerry Rodriguez, Coach Emily Cox, this is Jim Vinsky, the Tower Twenty Six B Race Podcast. Later, guys.